Hello, hello, and welcome back to Holistic Home. My name is Chelsea Whittakin, and I am your host. And today I'm actually bringing you some bonus content. So this week, I actually was a guest on someone else's podcast. It's a podcast called Passion for Acting, hosted by McGill Sebastian in collaboration with Sydney Actors Association. And he interviewed me all about my experience and journey as an actor and storyteller. So different kind of content, a bit more personal, but I hope you will watch and listen along. And also make sure that you are subscribed and following the podcast so that you never miss an episode. And for more daily content, make sure that you are following on all the socials. There's Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and even Pinterest. But in the meantime, enjoy the episode and I will talk to you soon. Hello and good afternoon, and this is a uh, happy Saturday from Mighty Meeks. So you can call me Coach Meeks, but today I'm the host of this uh, Passion for Acting podcast and featuring a special guest here. It's Chelsea Whittingham. How are you? Hi, McGill. How are you going? <laughs> Pretty good. Yep. But before we go further ahead with the questions and interview, I'd like to mention that this uh, sponsor, this is actually sponsored by Sydney Actors Association. And if you want to check on their Instagram page on the description box below. If you're watching this on YouTube, please follow them. And if you're an actor, if you're an actor actually looking to sharpen your craft in any way, shape or form, this could be the right place for you to do so. And just tell them that Miguel and even Chelsea sent you from Passion for Acting podcast. Okay, so but without further ado, uh, give us an introduction about yourself, uh, Chelsea. Hi, I'm Chelsea Whittacombe. Um, I'm based in Sydney as an actor, voiceover artist. I also have a podcast called Holistic Home because by trade, I am an interior designer and decorator. So awesome. lots of things going on, but it, it keeps life interesting. Oh, look at that. You know, you're, you're a jack of all trades in that uh, aspect. Huh? So, um, so tell me a little bit more about the introduction. So interior designing, does that go hand in hand well in your own way as an actor as well? Look, I think as an actor, you have to have things that you, you know, you have to have a base kind of job that you're involved in as well, because acting is so weird and all over the place that I think it's really important to have a base of something else. So like, that's my qualification. That's my base. And it is something that I'm also passionate about. And I think interior design really impacts your well-being. It's about your space and really how it makes you feel. And it keeps me on the road talking to people, which I think is always great influence for for your acting. Because, I mean, I, I work in retail as well in a homeware store, and I think that has been the best acting training I've had because you're dealing with people all day, every day, and you're interacting with all sorts. And sometimes I walk out of a shift going, I think I've got some new character inspiration today. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, because right? some people can get it from uh, video games or they just see a car that drives by. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to put that in a movie somehow. But you do it mm. in your retail. It's like, okay, that uh, good conversation I had with that nice lady or that altercation I had with that other other lady the other day about, like, you know, not having the product, you can use that in the scene. You know what I mean? Because as cheesy as it sounds, yeah, I mean, like... these – keep talking. Yep. It's all in those small moments, you know. It's everyday moments. Sometimes, like, the boring things – end up being great storytelling so oh big time yeah big time big time yeah you ever heard of a uh, big trouble in little china it's an action movie that was actually uh made in the late 80s have you heard of that i haven't no okay well i'll send you the link later on um thing on uh messenger and it, it, the, the link to the actual uh, trailer if you want to watch it if you're into that kind of martial arts or just the fancy kind of movies this could be the one for you that you can Watch tonight after your dad's um, birthday party, or what you call, or <laughs> even tomorrow. But uh, or have you at least heard Mortal Kombat? Cool, yeah, sounds good. Have you, have, have you heard of Mortal Kombat? Mortal Kombat the game. Yes. Okay, so that Mortal Kombat, the, the first very, the very first Mortal Kombat game was actually inspired by Big Trouble in Little China. So that's just a long story yeah, short. There you yes, go so again. All those little connections, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Expand your creativity. Even like you, know, you as an interior designer, you're probably even like, you know what, I bet you, I could be wrong, but, you know, analyzing the background that I'm in, you're probably analyzing, oh, okay, I can get inspiration for that, but if I was there, I'd do this instead. Am I correct about that? 
Yeah, definitely. I think you've got to you've got to really use your imagination, whether it be like sometimes I do commercial interior design as well, and I think you've really say you're going into an office space, you've got to imagine, okay, I am this career, you know, what are my relationships with the people who are in this office or this space and how are they going to use it, how are they going to interact with it and really I think it that is like the work of an actor and really comes down to storytelling and making sure it's authentic to those people. So I think it's it's really intertwined and that's also what makes it so fun and so creative. Exactly. I mean, it's just all about the process of having fun, because if it's not fun, why do it, right? You know, because, yeah, um, yeah because, you know, actors like us, we're dedicated to our craft. And uh, the good thing about it is when we're, we're either working on our passion projects or when you get, get an actual acting gig that we audition for, like a commercial TV show or whatnot, um, we're just grateful to be there. You know, we may yeah. feel like crap because we had lack of sleep or we may feel like <laughs> crap from the previous day of filming. But we always remind, we remind ourselves, oh, it's better than working at that odd job that's just around the corner when I was stacking shelves in the supermarket or just dealing with nagging customers, you know what I mean? So, yeah, but every little bit counts, you know. I mean, I'm just speaking from my experience. I'm pretty sure you've had Yeah, it's a good reminder. I think sometimes in those moments, those everyday moments where it can feel a bit of a drag or you've just you got to think it's all, it's all for the passion. It all comes down. Like everything is leading to those bigger projects or you know really making those dreams the reality that you you dream of so and um it's character building as well you know because you've heard, you've heard of so many actors like you know after a little while of pursuing acting and became successful then they blew it you know what i mean like mm. on set, outside of set um like you know they don't you know why spend their money wisely or they just act like they're in control of everything, including directing. So, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. Yeah. So, um, but speaking of which, going back to your um, interior designing thing, uh, what interests me about that is that, you know, uh, from your perspective anyway, is that you can be a DOP for that or you can give ideas to the DOP. Am I correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, in so many aspects, again, it just, it's intertwined so much and I think it gives you, that establishing lens of how something can look because I think very visual and the visualization is so high. So then that can translate to DOP and creating like establishing these beautiful scenes, whether that be in a film or in reality. Oh, of course, of course. I mean, see this, this office here that I'm using, um, I've used this for, a few passion projects, even like, you know, a couple of friends of mine, even that uh, feature film, indie feature film that I was in, that, that I just started, uh, what do you call it, Unseen Enemy. Um, they've, used this, they, they've used this office for a scene, for a couple of scenes, actually. So, uh, and the amazing thing is, is when the DOP is here, this is, okay, the sunlight's coming this way. I don't want this here. This has to be there, blah, blah, blah. And I lose track. I'm like, okay, where are we at? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's really cool, actually. Like, just... Uh, looking at what's around you and how can this work because I mean I don't know I think when you you think of a scene in a shop or something you know the best way to do it is to use a real one of that because you've got the counter and then you've got what's behind it and so it it feels more real feels more authentic so and how can you use that from the point of view as a DOP so it's really cool especially it's cool that you get to use that for your passion projects I I definitely love following you along on those it's cool to see it you know come from the idea into life oh look i appreciate that yeah because uh, this is one of those things that keeps me driven you know i'm pretty sure you 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 do your own things and uh keeping yourself keep being driven in this uh, aspect right but passion projects are one of those things that i know i'm in control of to a certain extent um i usually give it to the director's um advice or opinion of what can and can can go wrong uh, in, in the actual day uh, or what can work and what can't work, right? Uh, but, you know, it keeps my passion flowing, you know, because I see it from a different perspective. But, you know, while I'm auditioning for bigger and better things, uh, I like to do these things because, like, what if I don't get an audition for, like, at least a few weeks? You know what I mean? That's yeah. happened, yeah, you know, because it comes in batches. You know, there's sometimes, again, once a week, a few a week, once a fortnight, a few a fortnight, or sometimes just once a month, but it varies. But this is what keeps my passion alive. And just like the same thing with you, I'm pretty sure you do your acting courses and all that stuff. 
But leading to the next question here, Chelsea, what inspired you to become an actor and who inspires you to keep going? I am just such a lover of stories and storytelling. And I, you know, I always, I always had this big imagination as a kid and uh, I didn't even realize that it related to acting sometimes. It was just me like being outside and creating stories in my head and just, and having fun and having this big sense of play. And of course, I always enjoyed drama and movies and like theater as well. And I just realize it it all comes down to storytelling like you know I I'm someone who when I hear a song it's like I see the music video in my head it's just because I mean I particularly love country music and I find I that I'm drawn to that because it's storytelling aspect is just so visual and I really think that's what draws me to acting is it is this overall story. And, it, you know, again, interior design, I, when I'm working with my clients, it's about telling their story as well. So I think I try to base like my whole life around being like expressing yourself and your story. Okay. Yeah. You're right. It's actually storytelling because one of my um, <laughs> original acting coaches, Daniel Sesson, you are a part of the story. So whatever you role you're playing, Okay, so uh, whatever it is, you are part of that story. And when you're, if it's your time to shine, you got to tell the story in your own way, whether you're uh, playing the protagonist or the antagonist or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's just your time to tell the story. And you, that's the side of Chelsea that's playing the character, you know? Because, yeah, and I think... Um, keep going. Yeah, and I think you have to... A, the, the best stories come from truth as well. And I think it comes from sometimes stopping putting on airs and just do what's in your heart and and use real life emotions use real life experiences whether that's dealing with a Karen in a shop or an interaction with a best friend or something or someone something you've gone through and use that to tell the story because it's going to make the audience feel so much more connected as well yeah yeah because um my current acting coach said it's just they watch a movie not to watch us as performers they came yeah. there to watch themselves. How can they relate to that? You know, because yes. whatever character you're playing, whatever character I'm playing, if they don't, if they can't relate to it, they're, they're not going to get moved. It's like, what the hell is he talking about? Or what the hell is she talking about? Because they came to see not us, but more of themselves, how they can relate to that character that we're portraying. Just like, you know, um, if you're going through a hard time, like a breakup and all that stuff, and you're crying on set or on scene, uh, on screen. A lot of women, even guys, can relate to that. Oh yes, it, it hurts. It's it's like a dagger in the heart, you know. But um, they can relate to that. You know what I mean? But there are challenges. Like you know, for example, have you seen that um, uh, short film in where I was performing in U.S. dialect, uh, Broken Badge? I was playing a crooked cop. Have you seen that? I think I have. Yes. Okay. So long story short, I had to you know, uh, asked help from my, one of my original acting coaches, Daniel Sesson, right? And yeah. I said, coach, look, um, read the script. I would love to play this role. And the reason why I wanted to play the Crooked Cop is because my favorite movie of all time is called Training Day. Uh, it's that where Denzel Washington plays a Crooked Cop. And, you know, I said, look, coach, this is a very sinister character. How do I play? I don't think I'm a sinister character, uh, person in real life. <laughs> How do I play the ba bad guy? And then, you know, we researched it together during an acting lessons just like this online because he lives out in the mountains. So face-to-face okay. -face wasn't really – and plus, and plus, like, this is just, like, in the middle of the uh, first lockdown as well. And what oh, happened gosh, was – Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it was, that was really convenient in that context. But anyway, he just goes, okay, so this is a crooked cop. Let's uh, study crooked cops. What are their motives? So each crooked cop in history has had different motives of why they're crooked money, mm -hmm. exploitation, or abusive power towards women or even men, or just like they, they want to, you know, uh, stab people in the back so they can get higher up the ranks and all that stuff. So what is the motive of the crooked cop? And the other one is like serial killers, you know, because this is a crooked cop who's also a serial killer. And if you watch the context, that victim that uh, Samantha played, Samantha Camilleri played, was it, it, that's not the first victim. You know what I mean? My character that I was playing. Okay. So that was a very hard role to play. And plus, it was just only my second time performing in US dialect. So I had to hire a US dialect coach in, um, 
Paige Walker as well. So it's just like what I'm talking about is that um, I've never been a cop. I've never been a crooked cop. So <laughs> there are some things you need help with. How are you going to play a crooked cop? Or just like you, how are you going to play like um, – a female crooked couple, how are you going to play like a femme fatale? Or you, you don't seem like a femme fatale in real life, right? You know, so do you, do you get where I'm coming from? I do, yeah. I yeah. think it's definitely it, like you got to build that team as well. I think it's it, you put yourself in a vulnerable situation because you're putting trust in in people to to get to reach this character and to find what triggers they have and what makes them tick and and you know do things that they're they're doing that we then see on screen okay so have you ever played a role when you needed uh, like an expert like you know uh, somebody who you looked up to like an acting coach or you feel that somebody who's a as an actor is more experienced than you have you ever had that kind of challenge before just yet yeah i think look every role i do even if i really relate to them i definitely I have a friend who is so good at analysing scripts and um, I always go through a script with her and she just finds things in it and goes, see this line, this tiny little line, this is like a defining factor. And it could just be the way you do an inflection of a line or something. But she, I, yeah, I think, you know, I just had to, to realise that I did need help with it you know it's not all just you, you've got to get out of your head really you need to to use people um together to create a project it's it's not just all about the actor it's about working with your creative team and your support network as well to get this character to create an authentic experience for a viewer audience mm -hmm. whoever's watching yeah that's a good point actually because even though the context is the same the whole time, right? Like in each scene. Mm. And sometimes you just like, like what your friend says, okay, see this line here, it means this. So if, he, if she says she's going to kill you, she's going to kill you. Or mm. she could she could end up saying, no, she's just mocking her. Oh, I'm going to kill you for that. Like she could have analyzed it that way, you know? So that, I think that, that, is that what she, what, what she's trying to say or like? Yeah. Yeah. Similar? So she's helped me through all sorts of projects. Like um, it's been theater projects or it's been, um, what else has it been? Oh, like one of them was like an English period drama. Actually, they were all English period dramas, but they're all different time periods. And she was just really good at her research in terms of what was going on with society at those times and uh, status of characters. So I played a, like a low status character and she's like, Chelsea, you've, you're used to playing high status characters. You really need to uh, figure out, you need to, get into that character's life what was life like for that person below stairs rather than being part of the family upstairs so she would help me analyze those things and it was again it was small moments that really helped it was things like the way you would enter a room as a low status character you're going to be a lot quieter you're not going to burst in with all this confidence whereas when you're part of the family you walk in you own this house this is your place whereas if you're playing the maid or something, you, you're going to walk in and you know this is your this is your place of work and this is your this is your whole life. So you can't go stuffing that up in a way that you could with being the family. Yeah, character context is actually important. Mm. Yes, because it's like what you said, you're playing the maid. It's not like a, hey, hey, what's up? It's like you're going to hey, hey, man, my yeah. hey, sir. Um, what would you like me to start with today? You want me to vacuum your rooms or to clean the kitchen? So you're more professional. So compared to like, you know, you go to like, you know, a family gathering like tonight, like what you said, um, it's going to be different. It's going to be like, oh, hey, blah, 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 blah. And then afterwards, hey, bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. So it's your, you know, your demeanor, everything will be different compared to you playing a maid or even if you played, uh, you know, a soldier, you know what I mean? Or a, Absolutely. Like a boss babe. Yeah, so the boss say you'd be more assertive or even like a, as a cop, you know, if you played a cop as well or a detective, you'll be more assertive and authoritative compared to being that nice Chelsea to who you really are in real life, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, so it's just like different sides of you, how you can relate. And one of the things that my acting coach actually uh, keeps reminding us, have your childlike uh, acting skills on, just like, you know, the childlike faith that the, the Bible actually uh, preaches that's being faithful to God, uh, do do it to yourself as well in your acting skills, you know, because... Yeah, I love the way kids, you put yeah. that, yeah. 
Yeah, because remember, like when we were little kids, right? For me, I used to think I'm Batman, Superman. And I remember just the same third guy, one of my neighbors back there. Hey, look, did you know I'm Batman? Yeah. No, you're not. That's what he said to me. And you <laughs> know, it's I just wasn't. that absolute <laughs> belief, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, back then I was thinking, oh, this guy's an idiot. But I was, I was <laughs> idiot. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah. I'm not Batman. I mean, I'm not. Bruce Wayne's not Asian, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of the Do you know what that reminds me of though? You know the movie Hook, Robin Williams? And they yeah, go Rufio to Rufio you're talking about. Which Is one's that? Rufio. Rufio. You're talking about Rufio the character. I don't Hook. know the character's name. But I just know they go back to Neverland and like he's like an adult who was Peter Pan or something. And you yep. know, there's nothing on the table to eat and all the lost boys are eating the food and everything and having this feast. And it wasn't until he really let himself sink into it that all of a sudden this beautiful feast had arrived and it was all this incredible experience. And I I really try to use that as a reminder is if you've got a green screen behind you or you're looking out onto something that, and it's just, you know, it's an empty theatre, use that Peter Pan mindset. You're, you're back to being a kid. You're never growing up and you can imagine whatever you want. Yeah, you mean using your imagination, Peter. Imagination. <laughs> it's like you're doing it. Doing what? Using your imagination, Peter. It's like, hey, Rufio, want to get this? Like, you know, with that little <laughs> thing. And it, yeah. he, he literally gets some cake in his face, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah. <laughs> it's just that, that, um, that total, yeah. like, sink into it. Just so, with your whole heart, believe it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? You want to believe it with all your heart because, like, what made that scene come true for Peter Pan is because he literally believed that there was actually something in his brain. Hey, Rufio, check this out. You know, <laughs> um, yeah, because my brothers and I, back in the le- uh, early 90s, you, you weren't even born yet, but you know we used to watch that all the I'm time. Late 90s. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So, but anyway, I'm that old, and I don't mind. But um, anyway, um, that's the good thing about that, right? You know, because the, the Lost Boys can actually give us a, an idea of what it's like to have childlike, you know, faith in acting in the context of acting, and just using that imagination. Don't worry about what other people think. If you, if I really thought that I was Batman back then, I was really Batman. If you actually thought that you were, I mean, not that Elsa existed back then, maybe she did, but you know what? You could be Elsa or you could be Catwoman. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, this is. I love it. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Pass I'd like me to. right now. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, done. Done. You know, so um, I'm going to give you, you know, when we work together in the near future, Chelsea, and everyone can actually um listen to this as well. I'm going to cast you as some femme fatale, okay? Because I, I want to challenge you in that one, yeah? Yeah, Yay. so uh, bring the inner boss babe, like what a lot of ladies actually call themselves boss a boss babe. Exactly, yeah. So you're, you're in charge of this interior designing company. Just pretend that way. But anyway, I'll leave it up to you. And we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, okay? <laughs> yeah, love awesome. it. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm already excited, yeah. But anyway, um, so the next question will be: so please tell about t- tell us about your experience as a stand-in double and picture double for Elizabeth Moss in Invisible Man. So uh, this is a fascinating thing for me. That's why I picked this question. I loved that experience so much, and I feel so privileged that I worked full time as a stand-in and picture double. For Elizabeth Moss, for that film directed by Lee Winnell. So uh, the premises of a stand-in, though, is you basically stand in for the actor. So when they're setting up the shots for a film, um, they'll have you, me, in the same hair, makeup, costume as the actor. And what it is, it's going through the camera setup. So we'll do an establishing shot, say it's walking through the house. We'll get the camera following me to understand how that's going to do and you do the rehearsal then they bring the actor in, watch it once, and then we shoot. And so really this helps with uh, productive, being productive with the time on set, as well as um, allowing the actor to be fully focused in the scene rather worrying about technical aspects the full time. And then as a double, you actually are being filmed as that character. A lot of the time it's more close-up shots. So it'll be in The Invisible Man, it was a lot of hands, back of the head, um what else was it just kind of distant scenes as well like driving that sort of thing um so I worked on The Invisible Man full-time for about three and a half months uh it was it was just the best experience it was a thriller 
and I was given the script and every day I went on set with another scene and it was like that movie on set, like it felt so scary on set because it was so good, like it's so emerged into what that set was like. But the it was the best learning experience as an actor as well because I all day was on set just watching these actors do their things, like very professional actors who were so focused, so involved in the craft, and I got to to be part of that and have them mentoring me. And they were they were amazing to me. I was a little 19-year-old at the time, and it was just the most incredible experience. I cannot speak highly of it. Um, and just learning a script and getting to work closely with the directors and all the ADs and seeing how the set came to life locations, everything. It was just such a world um, of like, it was just fully emerged into that world of being an actor and being on set and the hours that it was like, how call sheets worked, everything like that in a totally professional aspect. And it was, you know, it wasn't an acting class. I wasn't just, you know, coming in, turning up. It was just boom, you're on location tomorrow in Jeringong, see you there at 7am. And it was just like, yeah, you have to be professional, you have to be focused and and just go for it. And it was incredible. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, you know, three and a half months of doing it, uh, you got the feel of what it's like to be in the big top, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then once you've gone there, you don't want to go back. You just want to keep want, wanting that type of experience more and more. But you know what? That's, that's earlier in your career, let that experience mold you and just let that experience actually drive you and that, that, that uh, you know what it's like to be on that set, even though you may not have had much dialogue or barely any dialogue, I don't know, but it was just a little good experience for you, you know what I mean? Because a lot of people who are looking at you in your shoes, especially ladies who have very similar features to you, like, you know, just uh, looks wise and all, the, and all that stuff, oh, how come she got the role, but I didn't, you know what I mean? Um, the, the people who chose you actually saw some potential in you to be that stand-in double, you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, it may be a small deal for them, but it's a big deal for you, you know, because you made things come, you made the project happen in your own way, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And it's just totally embracing it. And look, you know, with auditions and castings, it can feel really hard and disheartening because it's always it you know it does come down to how you look and you know regardless of what you are you're always going to be judged for it and you feel like you're never going to be what they're looking for but I think the best advice that I got really from Elizabeth Moss herself was you are what you are and you can't change it so just embrace it and mm -hmm. whether that, you know, is your shoulder width, your height, your hair colour, your eye colour, your personality traits, the way you speak, your voice, you have to embrace who you are, um, whatever that is, because it will work out if you are consistent and love it enough. Yeah, yeah. It, it all ties to self-belief as well, you know, because, um, you know, self-belief comes, it's, it, it's a contagious thing because, like, you know, whether you and I have self-belief or not, people can actually sense that, you know what I mean? Especially the ladies have strong intuition, you know, just um, the ladies can actually uh, feel my uh, my energy if they can, you know what I mean? They often can, just like, you know, um, when you believe in yourself and when you start developing that self-belief uh, and in yourself as a person and as an actor, um, it's going to resonate and people are going to be more attracted to it, but you're going to have your doubters and all that stuff. But, um, the good thing about self belief is that, you know, you, you develop not to think about like what other people think about you. It's all about just you as Chelsea Whittaker, believing in yourself. I may not get this audition. Oh, this is the kind of audition or role that I want for this movie. This is my dream role, but then hypothetically you been shortlisted two or three times and you may not get it and all that stuff it may be disheartening but you know guess what a lot of people like maybe 10 other people actually audition for that role but you've been shortlisted once or twice in a way it's a blessing you know because you're doing something right but you know um the good thing about this industry is is that you know like what you said you cannot control your look okay you've been blessed with whatever however you've been blessed with the way you look and your personality 
and the way you handle things and all that stuff, right? But what you can control is like, you know, just keep developing your craft as an actor and even as a person. Actually, the, the second one's more important because you're a person first before an actor, you know what I mean? Because uh, who you are as a person will help you develop your social skills. And um, of course, auditioning is a big part of the process of, um, you know, being successful in this industry. But overall, the best, uh, the most important skill in life to actually um, to be successful is social skills, you know? And, you know, you, I'm pretty sure you've also met talented people in this industry, but when you socialize with them, they're awkward, nothing against them, but they're awkward, but you cannot converse with them because you don't know how to relate to them. You know, I mean, you've, you've had that experience before, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think you can do so much to improve um, your acting skills, but really it does come down to the acting world being a business and you can't deny that you can't change that so how are you going to work with it it's a good question to ask yourself oh yes yes the business side of things because like you know there's so many actors you see in movies right and you're like oh this guy or this girl was actually in that movie but nobody knows their name they walk around people know, don't know what their name is but it's the people who are more successful the marketable ones or the people who see good potential and when it comes to that business side of things of course when we get that breakthrough role, they see potential in us so that they, we can make money back for them. That's how it is. Because um, why do you think Tom Cruise even, you know, because obviously he produces his own films and he's got all these big time sponsors, right? Like it, it, he can walk around IBM around the corner in um, St. Leonard's here. He could say, hey, look, um, I can you spare me $20 million just to be one of the sponsors for my next Mission Impossible movie? You know what they're going to say? Oh, hell yeah. Because you know why? Because it's going to come back to them. Because mm. IBM, they're going to use IBM products and all that stuff. So that's just a hypothetical speaking because it's a business. You know what I mean? Because um, you and I as actors, we can't just go to IBM. It's like, oh, I've got this big movie, blah, blah, blah. And like, who are you? And the, see, that's what I mean. We, we can't hold it against them when, if they react that way. It's because um, we haven't had that break yet. And once we get that break, you're going to be in a position to actually do more negotiate because that's the business side of things. It's more beyond just acting, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, you, as Chelsea, you can also Absolutely. be a successful actor. I mean, you can be, uh, you can have your own interior designing company one day, you know, never say never in that, you know. Exactly. I mean, I just embrace everything as much as I can. And I think that's why I've got interior design behind me because I love it. I mean, people love their homes. I mean, I I'm, I love watching those women uh, architectural digest videos of actors in their houses. And I think, you know, there's designers behind those, but there's also, uh, you know, like the HGTV worlds of um, presenting for interiors and homes and real estate. And so I think allowing yourself to be open to opportunity and to business and, and what makes it go around. Um, I just, I love it. I just think it's so interesting and there's so much opportunity and so many directions to go in. So it excites me a lot. Of course. And that's the good thing about it, right? Because like uh, I, I'm a firm believer in paying your bills with your act um, actions, uh, passions. Yeah. Okay. So if you're passionate mm -hmm. about like what you are about interior designing, you're not going to, when you're interior designing, you're not going to be born like, oh, I wish I was on set right now, blah, blah. I don't have to put up this crap. I don't know. Um, <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe not. But I was just assuming that anyway. Or at least sometimes, no, you, at easy. least, yeah, you see, that's the thing. Because aside from being in front of the camera, I love personal training because of my martial arts background, you know what I mean? Because that's the only thing that I enjoy when I'm in the gym training people or just giving them advice on health and fitness or even personal trainers like myself. What counselors were you? We, we hear about people's problems often, not all the time, but we often hear about like, you know, uh, relationship problems with their spouse or their girlfriend, boyfriend, or it, their kids, or even with their boss at work and all that stuff. I hear about it, but the only advice I could give to them is listen, but that comes for free with the package. But I love doing it because it's, it's, it's a passion. It, when I'm training people, I just don't feel like I'm working. It's like I'm getting paid just for something that I want to do. You know, so yeah, but it's, it's the same fantastic. thing. I mean, yeah, but it, it, you can relate to that as well, right? Like as an interior designer to some extent at least. Yeah, it's very personal. I mean, you're going into people's homes and you, you, you're hearing how, about how they live and everything. And so, yeah, I think that's where personal training and interior design can actually really relate because 
it's it's dealing with people and their lives and like personally what's going on. Yeah, that's right, right. And then they have a vision of uh, how they want their um, houses or even th their offices like this to look like. But, you know, you can critique them or you can give them advice on what they want, what their consultation is actually, their request is, right? Like, you know, because am I correct there? Like, you know, they can give you, they can ask you certain stuff. I want my house to look like this, this and this, or my office to look like this, this and this. Isn't that a part of your consultation as well? Or Definitely. Okay, good, good assumption that I just had. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah, because like it's all about just serving the people in their own way because a happy home uh, and and a happy work life is actually essential for your uh, mental health and self esteem. About to load out the yeah. hard way. Yeah, 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 so yeah big believer thing. in that. Yeah, Woo, there we go. We're on the same page with that. Anyway, so next question here. So, um, what was the experience like to have your first speaking role on Deadly Women? That was really fun. I I had done work uh, as a background extra, which was fun. And I had, you know, learned what it was like on set, really got the feel and the vibe for it. And then one day uh, I, you know, I got this, this, this job on um, the TV show Deadly Women. And it was really fun. It was out at Wiseman's Ferry, which was cool. It was a historic scene. And I hadn't seen the script prior to the day. It was a really like literally you go through hair and makeup, here's your script and, um, you know, had all the corsets on. It was a historical thing, uh, but it was really cool. It, it was set in the US, so it was US dialect as well. And I just remember like I had my line and it was like, I'll have my regular Johnny. And it was about like ordering a drink at the bar and it was really fun. Um, I hadn't done really anything like that on a set and I was just so excited. I just loved it. And uh, a few of the people that I was on set with that, I've seen them on other sets since. So it's really, it's really nice. And we always talk about that experience of, oh, I remember that time on Deadly Women at Wiseman's Ferry and we were ordering drinks at the bar and all of that. It was really funny. Oh, wow. And Wiseman's Ferry, that's just like around 40 minutes away from Castle Hill, right? Yeah, yeah. You kind of just go out past Dural and you just kind of keep going until you hit Wiseman's Ferry. Okay. I haven't been there since the mid nineties, I think. So, um, that's the last yeah. time I can remember I was there. So yeah. Cause like we used to go fishing there with a local Filipino church group and all that stuff. Or just sometimes we, uh, do a quick night sleepover or just a couple of nights, you know what I mean? Like over there in the tennis court and, uh, just the, the wharfs over there were good for fishing. So, uh, and, and some of the locals there were just like pretty friendly. And I remember like, um, as a little kid, like there's this, uh, nice older man, right? Like he's like tr true, truly dinky die Aussie kind of guy. And he was just crabbing and he got his, one of his crab, uh, cages and he caught this big mud crab and we were just fascinated. <laughs> oh, yeah. And he's like, oh, it's, oh, look at this boys. Oh, uh, my wife and I are going to have like, you know, a good tucker tonight and, uh, very dinky die, right? And, uh, <laughs> and he just goes, oh, you want to have a cl closer look? And then he grabbed my hand. He pretended to put my hand inside there next to the, oh. yeah. No, 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 no. And then I, I ran off and I'm just like, oh. and he goes, oh, come on, mate. I wasn't going to do that. I was just like, joking. Come on, come on. And I, I went back and he was, I made friends with the old man. I can't remember what his name was, but I remember <laughs> that to you. It was, it was like for that split second, oh, no, 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 no. Like, you know, he grabbed mine pretending he's going to put it next to the claw of the crab. You know what I mean? So that would have snapped my finger in half, in my opinion, but um, who knows? Yeah, yeah. So, oh, my uh, God. Like? Yeah, yeah, I know. But that was, that was back in 94. This is way before you were born again. So, yeah, I keep bringing it up. But uh, <laughs> uh, late 1994, actually, they, around Christmas time. Uh, but, yeah, so um, I don't know. It's like, you know, we're about in Wiseman's Ferry. We actually go, uh, you know, filming your scene anyway. Is it in the, uh, what do you call it, the takeaway shop, in the top shop there or what? I think it was right next door, actually. It was the Wiseman's Ferry Inn. And oh, I think they were, yeah, they were filming there because oh, we were filming in a few different areas of it. There was a downstairs bit where they, it, it had the historic look to it. And I think that was a big draw for them. And it had like big, heavy draperies and everything like that. And then um, very dim lighting, smoke machines, really to give it that, um, sort of dingy downtown look 
Uh, it looked amazing. I remember walking in at the time thinking, wow. And then hair and makeup was up in some of the hotel rooms and they also had that historic look. So it, that was also good preparation because I went in really, I didn't have the script until like, that moment so it was really good it, going through hair and makeup in this historic setting really helped to to get into the character oh, okay and that's a heritage listed um, kind of venue isn't it um, I'm not sure I, I mean it probably is I'm not I'm not 100 on the specifics but I I know it's been there for a long time and if it did have that historical look to it it, it probably would be yeah yeah, yeah, because I thought it's been so so long, you know, since I've been to Wiseman's Ferry, and um, I can vaguely remember, like, you know, some of the old school looking, like, you know, it's as if like during the early nineteen hundreds, where it's colonial still and all that stuff. So um, yeah, like that Australian colonial look. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I got to check it out one day, you know. So um, I don't think public transport's going to allow me to get there because uh, it's going to no, be. I think you're going to have to go for a little road trip. Yeah, why not? So yeah, so, living in Chatswood here, like um, I just um, I don't need a car. You know what I mean? Uh, I could probably invest in a car one day, but it's just like I got public transport ready available for me. Like even going out to your area now, we've got the metro. I don't need yes. I don't need a car. So yeah, but it's just across that bridge when you get there. Yeah. So um, but yeah, speaking of that, yeah, because like it's another big set that you were in of course like you know i've never seen an episode of deadly women but you know what in my acting class or even my fellow actors we talk about it every now and then about how they it's all mostly ladies who still talking about this stuff and they love it you know what i mean and from what i can understand it's actually like you know in the older days of um of america right like am i correct yeah it was all uh, it was all different time periods uh it would swap episode to episode uh, and it was about, basically, it was about women who were killers. <laughs> and it was the stories of how that happened. So um, I wasn't the killer, but I kind of wish I was. That would have been fun. Um, but, yeah, it was basically these women, whether it was a, a situation they were in and, like, it was abuse or something, it was – really just telling those stories so it was a really interesting premises for a for a show oh, okay okay now um i'm curious now so is it on netflix because i might start watching it now i'd have to check it's you know when you go online and you say where to watch things i'd have to oh, double yeah. check that one i think yep. it, it might be on like seven plus or one of those kind of ones Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll check if it's at Netflix or even in YouTube first, you know, so um, yeah, YouTube. maybe YouTube is a good place to start. Okay, okay, maybe Disney Plus. I mean, I don't have Disney Plus yet. There's but, so but, many nowadays, it's hard to keep up. I can't even, I, I can't even be bothered because like I'm there sometimes like watching, I'm about to, in my downtime, I'm just about to, okay, let's check Netflix, Netflix or what's available. There's too many to choose from. I'm just like, and I'm contemplating, okay this or that, this and that. And then I'll watch the first five minutes and I'm not interested. I'm going to watch another something else, something new. And it, it, it occurs again, oh, I'm not interested because it's like first five, five minutes didn't really interest me. There's just too much to, um, you know, to choose from. And that's that's the downside of stuff like Netflix and Disney Plus. So, I know um, we have way too much access to all of these, these shows and films. I know, I know. But you know what? Um, that's my problem I need to deal with. It's just like stop. It's a good problem to have, hey? <laughs> Indecisiveness. You know, I hate being indecisive, but you know what? I'm human. But you spend too much weird. time deciding what to watch that you don't end up watching anything. <laughs> That's right. Or I just end up watching just YouTube videos and like murder cases or like this and that. Because sometimes like, you know, I'm just, that's what I'm in the mood for because like police investigation stuff, you know, believe mm. it or not, back in the day when I was a little boy, um, I wanted to be a cop, but that died down subconsciously. I didn't recognize that it died down until later now you on. Get to into... play one instead. Yes. And that's my typecast. You know, I used to play a <laughs> cop and um, a lot of, um, Asian actors who I know, ma male actors, uh, you know, they're kind of like, oh, how do you, how come I always get to play the role that's of, a, of an accountant or a chef or a taxi driver, the boring roles? How can, how can you get, how, how do you, how do you get like the roles of a soldier or a cop? Because you got to look the part, you know, because if, if you don't like the way you're being typecasted, work out, get a haircut, you know, so you can't change your height, but you can actually work out, get a haircut or just, look the part or do your own passion projects where you can prove to them that you can play the roles that you want to play. 
It's as simple as that. No need, no, no use nagging about it because it's not going to get you anywhere. Period. <laughs> yeah, I think Tom Cruise actually said something like that. He was like, "You've got to project what it is that you want to, what you want to be." So it's like, don't say, "Oh, I think I'm going to do that." Say, "I am that," and then that's one step closer to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm a big fan of Tom Cruise, and I'm going to take that uh, advice on board because um, he's the man. He's the biggest uh, seller in the box office. Yeah, but he's, thank you, yeah, Uncle it's Tom. incredible what he's done. Yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. Uncle Tom, if you're actually listening to this, thank you from the bottom of my heart for keeping inspiring me to do my own passion projects. I'm pretty sure that Chelsea can relate to that to some way or shape. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I call him Uncle Tom because he's, the same, Tom. Age as, he, he, he's the same age as my dad anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, next question here. So, uh, please tell us uh, about any highlights you had playing as Edna in an inspector calls for Castle Hill Players Club. In that season. Yeah, that was a great experience again. So that was this year, 2024. Uh, it was a really cool experience. So I was Edna the maid. And again, this is where I was playing. I'd played a lot of uh, English ladies of society before. And so I was playing Edna the maid. Um, so it was, uh, it was really cool to play that dynamic and, um, yeah, kind of look after the household and everything like that. But it was a really good society to be a part of. It was such a professional experience with theatre. Um, and with theatre, it's it's amazing because we did, I think we did 15 or 16 shows throughout February of this year. And with theatre, you know, every night, every performance, you've got a new set of audience coming in to watch that show. And so it has to be perfect for them because they're experiencing that for the first time. So I think putting all your energy into that show every single time uh, is, again, really good training. It's a, it's a big commitment. It takes a lot out of you but is also a really rewarding experience. And what was the venue at? Was it in Castle Hill RSL? Or? Yeah, it's at. There's a theatre in Castle Hill Showground, which is actually it's actually linked to Hill Showground Station on the Metro now, uh, and mm. they've got a really good space there. From the outside, it kind of looks like a random building, but in the inside, it's a really good tiered theatre. It seats um, over 150 people in there. Great lighting setup, sound setup, everything. So. Oh, okay. I think um, I could be wrong. This is where um, the Hill Centre used to be, right? Because, like, you know, one before. It is, actually, yeah. Yeah. Oh, voila. That's what I thought. Because when you said theatre, because I remember, like, you know, before I moved here to the North Shore, I could vaguely remember that um, the Hill Centre was demolished and apparently they're going to rebuild something even better. Uh, yeah, but, well, we're not yeah. in, like, it's not a new building that we're in. I've, I think it's, it's like, it's actually, like, 50-year-old building or something. But it, it's in that same, it's in that vicinity, like where the Hills Centre used to be. Like it's in that, you drive in there and it's in that same complex. Yeah, because I remember like, you know, um, in the earlier days of when Hillsong Church used to be called Hills Christian Life Centre, because like, you know, my family and I were part of that church back then. Um, that's where they used to hold the Sunday services, morning and evening. Oh, right. Yeah, because it was yeah. a big venue, that one. Yeah, it was, it was. But, you know, obviously the, the, that church had to get its own venue because they were growing. But, um, yeah, so this is because I reckon if I step foot in there, it's just it's going to be so nostalgic of back when I was a little boy, you know, just that restless little boy who was often getting su uh, trouble in Sunday school. <laughs> uh, yeah, so those were the days. And I'm like thinking, oh, I remember this is where my mom was yelling at me or my dad was yelling at me. <laughs> Being a bad boy in, in Sunday school. So, <laughs> well, they yeah. often say you remember the things that went wrong or when you were bad, sometimes more so than the good things, which is kind of sad but funny at the same time. Oh, we can laugh about it now, but back then it was so embarrassing. My mum and dad yeah. were kind of yelling at me in front of everybody. It's like, Mom, don't, don't. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to get embarrassed here. But it's just, in a way, I deserved it because, you know, looking back, I could laugh at it. But this is, uh, it's not what do you call it, traumatising for me anymore, but it's just something I could laugh at, you know. You so, can look um, back on it. You can reflect. Yeah, 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 because I was just like, I don't know what do you call it, the Asian Bart Simpson back then, so uh, <laughs> I don't know what got into me, but I think it's martial arts and acting that just got me more disciplined and just, like, mm. you know, put my energies into uh, other things instead. So, yeah, but, you know, um, that little boy is still in me, but it's just that I, I expend that energy somewhere else instead of just running him up to 
other people because otherwise I could be in jail already. Thank God I'm not. Thank you, Lord. I'm not in jail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, and uh, good job, McGill. <laughs> oh, like, glory to him. But yeah, but you know, that, that's the thing about theatre, right? And um, you're just being in the moment. You can't just go, oh, crap, oh, can we start up again? Uh, the director in the middle, middle of, uh, you know, the performance, they, they can't actually tell you, hey, um, okay, cut from the top. You just have to play by it if you stuff up. If you feel that you stuff up, you just have to improvise. Or sometimes you have to improvise to save your fellow actor on stage because um, they forget their lines or they just forget their dialogue and you just forget to do something. You can remind them of that, you know, so yeah. Um, but I'm sure yeah. you've had those experiences as well in, in theatre, in your own I mean, there's no cut, there's no reset, there's no director's notes. I mean, you... You do all that work in rehearsals and then as soon as you, you have opening night, basically the the director hands the show over to the stage manager and it becomes something different um, and you just have to you just have to go with it. And, you again, you have to put a lot of trust in your fellow actors and your stage crew uh, and, and work together. And also with theatre, you really do vibe off the audience a lot and that can really change the show sometimes. So it's really... It's an incredible experience and uh, really good training because I think it makes you a better screen actor as well because there mm. is that pressure. Yes, I need to know my lines. Yes, I have to know this show inside out. I have to know my cues. Everything has to be sharp. It's it's really good, really great experience. Oh, of course, of course. It's like, you know, it's just, it's still acting, but it's like rugby league and rugby union, <laughs> same sports but different rules. And <laughs> Yeah, so well, yeah. we can apply different principles because obviously, obviously for me, I feel that theatre for me is more of a sprint, you know, just being out like, hey, everybody, hey, Chelsea, good to see you, my friend, what's up? Anyway, today's show, like, it's going to be like that, like, you know, it's a bit of an energetic thing and, you know, because otherwise they can't feel it because if we're talking yeah. to them, yeah, so if we're talking to them, I think the you have to also make it look like um, – you don't want it to look like you're thinking about what to say next. You really want it to look like you're reacting to what's going on on stage because, yeah, you've done this show a hundred times, but you don't want it to look like that. You need it to look like in the moment, like you're, you're shocked and how are you going to show that? Or this is a scary situation or the inspector's coming for you. Oh, what are you going to do? You have to react. You don't want to be thinking too much ahead. Somehow it's like your body goes into a meditation and you have to just let the show express itself through your body yeah just being in the moment like what you said because you know because obviously you react better and you perform better being in the moment and just um you know just like with anything you think too much about it it's not going to look convincing you know so um when you're thinking too much about your dialogue um like what my current acting coach says uh whether it's theater or a film when you're saying your lines you're not saying it to yourself you're saying it to that person so, for example, if we're, if we're playing in a romantic movie right now. Chelsea is like, oh, Chelsea, look, I'm glad I found you. I can't live without you. I'm saying that to you, not to me. So there's a difference between just like if I'm practicing that dialogue and, yeah, all of a sudden I'm in love with myself. No, no, no. I'm not in love with myself. I'm in love with Chelsea's character. So do you get what I'm saying? Because it's like, you know, you saying it to them and you're saying it like a question so that they can react. So you know what I mean? Because if I just say, oh, I love you. Oh, Okay. What do you mean you love me? So there's no reaction there. But if you say it as a question, uh, as a reaction, then it's better. So you can react, your, your character can react to it. Oh, Mace, I love you, but, you know, I love somebody else. I'm like, what? You know, so, so you know what I mean? Like, you know, there's a, there's a reaction to that. You know, it's just like, it's like that, uh, what do you call it? The rom-com that's just gone wrong. The guy who's thought he's in love with a girl and all of a sudden, oh, she chose somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, we were talking about that. My mate Hassan and I were just talking about that during dinner last night in Bakemba and how, like, you know, we can, like, you know, because we shared about, like, how we've been rejected by women, like, you know, all that stuff. And us guys, we're used to it, right? But, um, like, you know, of course, it can be heartbreaking, especially if we're in love with a girl. But at the same time, um, you know, when you, if you, I told them, look, bruh, bruh if you're not interested in a girl, no point leading her on you can reject her in a civil way and but guess what in most cases the ladies actually take rejection rejection a lot more harsh than us because they're not used to it as much as us so mm. you can use that um in in your acting thing you know what i mean so if your character actually has uh is in love with another guy but that guy's a player sees different women 
blah, 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 and you get heartbroken, you could use that somehow. You know what I mean? Whether you're not, you've gone through that in real life, that's your business, but you can use that. You know what I mean? So there's a, I thought he was in love with you. You know, yeah, so we're <laughs> getting a bit, to- oh, bit, bit off top. Absolutely, I you. feel it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I might have just given you some ideas and you, you see it again, or your, your new um, your new passion project, you know what I mean? You could be uh, Romeo and Juliet and uh, you could have your own version of Taylor, Taylor Swift's song, you know what I mean? Like the love story. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, uh, you know what? I mean, before we go on to the last <laughs> question, like, you know, I, I can tell you this, that, you know, um, I started liking that song uh, one time, uh, second last time I visited Manila, you know, because there's these two, uh, you know, lovely teenage girls who sang that song. And they, they, when they were singing it as a duo, they're singing it like they sound exactly like um, Taylor Swift. I'm like, oh, oh, wow. Yeah. And then that's what I mean. So, uh, but let that, if you want to do that love story, have your own Romeo and Juliet version you know what i mean so yeah so you can be obviously you can be juliet you can find your romeo you put it on star now casting romeo for my yeah so anyway that's an idea for you because it, it, those kind of roles suit you i reckon yeah that's not i'm not saying that's the only mm. role that will suit you that genre suits you well but you know well that's why even though that's like well, that genre i think i think i naturally suit it and so i think i've really leaned into that as well <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Why not? You know, because if, I can tell that's your, that's your your passionate genre. You know, so um, if that's the case, work on your strengths first before your weaknesses. You know, because when time okay. goes by, when you've had when you've had enough gigs playing the Juliet kind of princess kind of roles, you can you know shift into a bit more femme fatale roles or the boss babes or whatever you call it. So yeah, just to show your versatility, because more than anything, there's more to Chelsea as an actor that meets the eye, you know what I mean? So, yeah. So, um, you know, cause, and that's another thing because I'm trying to break my own stereotypes and all that stuff, even for myself, the next passion project I'm doing, I'm going to be in a vulnerable position where I ha- don't have any power, but you'll see what I mean. Okay. So it's just one of those things, but you know, last question, uh, for you, Chelsea is, uh, do you have any words of encouragement for our fellow actors who are struggling with discouragement? Yeah, I think if you really love it, keep going with it. Follow your passion, follow your dream. Um, but also uh, be intelligent, have another job. Don't solely rely on it. I think it's really important to be able to support yourself because you don't want to, um, you know, not be making it where you think you should be and then getting upset and depressed. I really I don't think that's worth it. So look after yourself and your well-being. And get involved as much as you can, whether it means joining local theatre and connecting with fellow creatives. Be be a support. Be on Instagram and, you know, find find what you love and how can you be part of it. Well, that's an awesome advice there, yeah. And it, it all falls down to creating your own passion projects as well or even it, it all falls down to uh, maybe just starting off with student short films for those of you who are listening okay especially with a few actors who i know are listening to this right now we're just starting out in acting create your own passion projects start from the bottom because there's no point starting two or three notches up and then all of a sudden you're going to get um, overwhelmed by that you need to start from the bottom do some extras work like what chelsea and i have first couple of years I did extras work as well and uh you know of course it's not ideal but you'll be grateful that you went through it because that's your foundation yeah but yeah but it's been a pleasure having you on board Kelsey thank you so much for your time and uh I hope you have a good night tonight at your old man's thank you. uh, you know, uh event but um yeah but that's pretty much it everybody who's listening if you haven't done so yet please press the like and subscribe buttons and uh, also put Chelsea's uh, Instagram page on uh, the description box below so you can follow her and support her in her own journey if you want to. And I highly encourage that you do anyway. And this is Miguel, aka Mighty Mix, and thank you for tuning in until the next episode. Have a good rest of the day. Adios. Thanks, Miguel.